evidence from orbit for these clay minerals. And the clay minerals in particular are fascinating because they do require uh, water, a lot of water, to interact with rock over some time to form these minerals. Uh, and it's done through spectroscopy from orbit. There could be some errors. There could be some things we don't understand about the data. But we will have a definitive knowledge of the minerals with this rover. So understanding that clay environment and actually trying to figure out what sort of the, the, the rest of the environmental conditions on Mars were that caused that clay to form, uh, what the weather was like three billion years ago, uh, what the temperatures were like. Uh, and that gets at this whole issue of, of creating a habitable environment. Uh, so, you know, we can't wait to drive across the ellipse over several months and get to that first clay outcrop. Uh, and then we'd go up the hill and look at the sulfate salt area, uh, which should represent a different environment. And so I think, you know, we have a lot of steps that we'll go through. Really, we're, we're reading the history of early Mars in several different environments. And if any of those look definitive, no, I don't know if, I won't say definitively, but if any of those really scream out that this was a potentially habitable environment, we'd tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, you have another question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for Pete, um, in my experience with engineers, they always have a list going somewhere in their heads of the things they're most concerned about. Um, I'm wondering uh, what things are at the top of your list in terms of what you're concerned about. And also, in the Murr experience, there was a lot of testing and getting ready right through the cruise stage um, because there was, the timeline was such that there was still a lot to go. Now, you had two years extra on this mission, so maybe you're not quite as up against it with some of the software, but I wonder if you could talk about what's at the top of your concern list and will you be doing additional testing of equipment on the cruise, day, on the cruise phase? I think, I think the thing at the top of my concern list is, is what I don't know. Um, you know, these things are very complicated beasts and, and you test the heck out of them, but, but you can't test all their interactions, you can't test them for the length of time of the mission, you just can't do all that kind of intensive things. And so there's always going to be surprises. Uh, sometimes engineers call them features. And, uh, and, and what you worry about is that there's something there that's really serious. You know, um, um, when Murr launched, we had done what we thought was a, was a comprehensive test program, but we had four surprises after we launched that we had to fix operationally, and we were able to do that. Um, but what's, that's what you worry about, that there's something in the design that you haven't caught yet that something in the interaction with the Mars environment that you're not able to test on Earth, uh, that there's uh, something in long duration exposure that you're not able to do, that, that something like that will catch you. And, um, and, and it'll be a software thing more than likely. That's, that's what you worry about more than anything else. Um, you asked the second question and I... Uh, yeah, well, it would be nice to be say that the two years allowed us to be completely done uh, on the Friday after Thanksgiving, but that's not true. Um, we have a lot of work to do to characterize the sample handling and sample processing system, as Oshwin pointed out. One of the things we've discovered in the last year of testing is, is the interaction with the rock systems, with the rocks, very dependent on temperature, very dependent on pressure, very dependent on the composition of the rocks. So we're laying out a very comprehensive test program to basically lay out for us what are going to be the operational rules of the road, uh, and as we interact with rocks, what will we have to do to, to do first-time activities, what we say, and, and to be able to do those things. So, so that's a test program that we've got laid out. We will continue to do development for entry descent landing in the sense of running the software again and again and again and testing all the corners of the environmental box to make sure that you're very robust in terms of what Mars could throw at us from an atmosphere or dust storm sense. We don't expect dust storms. We're in the wrong season but we'd like to be prepared for everything. Um, and, then, uh, and then we've got some software development for the surface mission to engage in. So um, we're a little bit thankful. Murr was a seven-month cruise. We're thankful we have eight and a half. We'll use it all. Um, but we will, be, we will be busy over the cruise period for sure. Okay, now we're going to transition to the telephone lines, and uh, we're going to wrap up after the phone lines, but let's see if we can take a few questions there. And I believe first up is uh, Irene Klotz from... Reuters. Irene, are you there? Yes, um, thanks, Duane. I have uh, two questions. The first, um, there's, uh, I think that there was another instrument added um, with the delay in the Mars Science Lab launch that actually was very much uh, um, targeted to looking at the types of organics, if any, are found, which is maybe a little closer than what you've described so far as far as being able to assess life. Can you um, 
Can you talk about that a little bit? And then uh, I do have a, a, a related question. Thanks. And with the mission since its inception, in fact, the mission was really designed uh, partially around, the rover was really designed around this instrument. Uh, it's the workhorse laboratory. It's called SAM, Sample Analysis at Mars. And it's a suite of instruments that uh, analyzes that powdered rock or soil sample and even the air as well and looks element by element what the composition is and it also has the capability to detect any organic material that's in the rocks or soil. Now we consider that kind of a, a science home run. It sort of gets at uh, Joe's question too. Uh, that is something, you know, we, that would make the papers, but we're also not banking the mission on that. Uh, we don't know if Mars has the ability uh, to retain any organic material even if it's there. So part of this mission also is, is understanding, you know, now looking at ancient Mars three billion years later, what sorts of evidence does Mars preserve for us to study today from when it was probably more habitable in the past? Uh, so we do have a fabulous organics detection capability on the rover, and if we find something, it's a home run. My next caller is Clara Oskowitz. Um, thanks very much. And I think the other question is for Doug. Um, has Russia requested any assistance from NASA in trying to uh, track or do anything to recover the Phobos Grunt mission? Uh, we have offered assistance, um, and if they need it, we will provide to the best of our ability with our uh, space communications network. Um, I, that's a different organization than ours. I'm not sure if they've asked for the assistance, but we have offered it. Okay, thank you, and I apologize, Irene, uh, uh, that you had a follow-up. Okay, now we can go to Clara Moskowitz from Space.com. Clara? Hi, this is a question for anybody who wants to take it. Um, you know, based on all you know right now, just how likely do you think it is that you're going to find evidence that Mars was habitable? And, and just how likely is it that you think Mars ha ever had life? I, I'm not sure that any of us want to take that. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, you can add to this. Okay, sure. Uh, it's That's kind of... A request for speculation, and I really kind of hate to do that. Um, let's take MER as an example. Nobody would have expected to see the blueberries that we see, that we see by the millions, um, and, and that was a huge discovery. Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has found evidence in, in mid-latitudes, actually a little higher latitudes than we'd ever thought, of uh, briny waters that could actually uh, be um, liquid on the surface for short periods in certain seasons. So every time you turn around, there's something that Mars does for us or shows us or, or reluctantly uh, hands to us that uh, maybe we're looking for it and maybe we're not looking for it, but it's always exciting and it always feeds the science. Um, so I really don't want to speculate on how likely it is that we'll find these things because we may not find those. We may find some, something completely different. So uh, it's, it's a little tough to speculate. So now I'll let our scientists speculate for just a second. Uh, the first thing I'll do is clarify uh, for the uh, for the people new to Mars exploration that we didn't find blueberries on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are hematite crystals, but they're fabulous things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'll just say, I, I was going to say the same thing as the caveat, which that, that would be sort of in the realm of speculation, but uh, you know, on the positive side, the reason we're excited about Mars exploration and going to Gale Crater is that when we look in the distant past, uh, sort of the early billion or two years of Mars history, we've known now for decades uh, that there's evidence for rivers flowing and uh, possible lakes, even a possible evidence of a lake in the crater we're going to. We're not sure about that, but that's why we're going there. We're trying to find out if there were uh, these habitable environments which uh, would involve liquid water. And so... Uh, you know, we're targeting, I guess the best way to say it is, you know, through the science community, through hundreds of scientists that have helped select this landing site, we've chosen the best possible place to discover a potentially habitable environment, and we'll see if we find one. Oh, but we find blueberries uh, with uh, MSL. I can write the press release. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that. All right, uh, next caller, Dan Leon from Face News. Dan, are you? Right here, thanks. A uh, question for anybody who wants to tackle it. Uh, we know that the planetary science budget was going to go down anyway, and now we know to save James Webb it's going to go down a little bit more. What contingency plans, uh, if any, have you made to support the primary MSL science objectives? 
uh, in, in uh, the likely situation that the budget for this division is, is going to fall off a cliff a little bit next year. Anybody who'd like to take it? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, MSL is an incredibly important flagship mission for this agency. Um, we've been in the build and test phase for years. Uh, it is that bridge mission, and it's as important to this agency, I would personal opinion, a little biased maybe, as Hubble. Um, the funding for MSL is stable. Um, the agency PMC, the administrator, um, has signed the, uh, the current budget estimates that we've got for it. That money is set aside. Uh, if there are funding reductions in the 2012 budget, uh, once it gets passed by Congress and in the current budget uncertainties, who knows. Uh, but if there are, the MSL uh, operations funding is safe. Okay, we have time for a couple of more questions from our phone lines, and then uh, we'll take one last question from our studio audience. Um, let's go to Raphael Jaffer, and I'm sorry, I'm having problems with names today. Um, Jaffe, Mr. Jaffe, I'll take that news. Uh, but if there are, the funding is safe. Raphael, are you there? We have time for a couple. Okay. All right. I tell you what. Let's uh, let's see if we can come back here too. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Kitty Feldy with KPCC Public Radio in Los Angeles. Could you talk a little bit about um, the propulsion system? Since you're not using the solar panels that the earlier rovers had used, because if you say nuclear, people seem to have a problem with that. Can you talk about the safety issues of launching nuclear fuel into space. Well, let's see. We're, we're using the power sources of multi-emission radioisotopic thermal generator. It uses plutonium dioxide uh, in uh, in center cylinders and then bricks inside of a of a cylinder in order to generate electricity using thermocouples. Uh, it's a, a direct heritage of uh, designs for such standard generators that have been used on a lot of deep space missions and, in fact, used on on a, to withstand severe environments, including reentry. Um, there is. Uh, a process we go through that perhaps Doug can speak more to, where we go through a, a, a very sophisticated safety analysis involving the launch vehicle people and DOE and independent reviewers to define the environments and to look at the safety of this device with the environments and to make a judgment as to whether it's safe to go. And uh, we've been very safe, safety, and, and uh, commit to its use. Let me add that uh, we, we expect a safe, and successful launch. And as you said, they, we've been applying these power sources for, for 50 years. And if you have uh, any more details you like, we'll get you with the appropriate Department of Energy officials on their power source. Let's uh, go back to Kennedy and to Marsha Dunn. Thank you. Um, just a couple of uh, quick factoid questions. I think you mentioned a couple hundred meters above the surface of Mars for the sky crane to start operating. Do you have anything more precise than that? How high will the rover be when the sky crane pops out? Um, secondly, how deep into the rock or dirt will the drill go when they're looking for samples? And lastly, if you lose a wheel or two, can the rover still uh, go along the surface and do some science. Thank you. Yeah, if you contact Wayne's office, I'll get you the actual uh, hard number for the uh, deployment of the sky crane. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. Uh, the drill goes, I believe, five to six centimeters into the rock surface. Uh, and you have one more. Oh, if I lose a wheel. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly fine if we lose a wheel. Um, this is the situation a little bit better than MER because we actually have we can release the, the braking of the, of the motors on, on, uh, on this vehicle, and we're not able to do it so much on MER. So we don't have to drag the wheel like we had to do on MER. We can actually freewheel the wheel. Uh, we certainly are okay if we lose one. Depending on the uh, terrain, we're, we're probably okay if we lose two. Um, each of the wheels has its own drive motor, so we have six drive motors, and the four corner wheels have independent steering motors. So we've got a lot of flexibility in, able to, in order to maintain mobility in the, in the event of a of a motor or gearbox failure. Okay, folks, what I'm going to do here, uh, we're going to wrap this up. And uh, I again want to remind you of the series of detailed briefings that will be coming out of the Kennedy Space Center on launch week. Uh, in summary, right now, we're green across the board to go back to Mars.
please go to www.nasa.gov slash MSL.